Corporate leaders are under constant pressure to produce quarterly financial expectations, and now new research from INSEAD shows that these quarterly short-term wins often come at the expense of long-term competitiveness. INSEAD Professor of Strategy Javier Jimeno joins us now to tell us a little bit more about all that. Thank you very much for being with us on INSEAD Knowledge. Thank you, Shelley. Okay, what about these short-term pressures, and why are they so compelling? Well, this is um, uh, the story of uh, unintended consequences. Um, the, initially, the role of investment analysts was to provide information for investors to be able to make the right uh, investment decisions in the long term, and, and also to provide some benchmark and evaluation of managers so that they would be, uh, they would be effective in, in the role. But what has happened is that uh, since it is hard to evaluate really the long-term value of these companies, more and more of these evaluations have focused on relatively short-term performance and earnings benchmarks. So uh, the, 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 the traditional case is the quarterly earnings. Certainly what we found in our study is that some of the behaviors that companies engage when facing this short-term earnings pressure ends up leading to take actions that are bad for competitiveness. Uh, one of the interesting findings for us was that Companies that had more long-term investors and more long-term uh, incentives for executives tended to engage less in this type of short-term earnings management behavior than those companies that have more short-term ownership. Can, can you give me a sort of example? It sounds like maybe a more family-oriented business or other than a, a day trader kind of investor. Well, so, so in fact, what, what we look in terms of the investors are all institutional investors, but institutional investors is a large category. I mean, you have uh, companies like Versailles Hathaway and Warren Buffett that invest in fewer stocks. They keep them for the long term, and, and each of their owner stakes are sizable relative to the size of the company, which means that they are partners with management to understand the issues of the company and to make strategic decisions with them. Now, if you contrast that with some of what we call the transient investors, which basically are looking for surprises. So they buy at a particular price, and they hope that in the next quarter, something good is going to happen, and they are going to sell for a, for a gain. These, these investors are very fickle, and any negative information are going to lead them to sell. Now, it, what we found is that companies that had predominantly ownership, but transient investors, reacted a lot more to this earnings pressure because they didn't want to create a stock market surprise that would lead to these investors to go away and potentially the, the managers lose their job. It would be kind of boring if you only had Warren Buffetts out there. I mean, nothing would be happening. That's, that's a great point. In fact, this is an ecosystem. You need both. Um, so you need short-term investors in order to create a market and to give information about prices. But if all of the investors were short-term, what you would see is huge volatility in the market. So I think they actually feed on each other and support one another. Uh, the, the more short-term investors, the more opportunity for long-term investors to find opportunities. Uh, and then long-term investors as well create some, some buffer uh, against the, the short-term pressures for, for the others. Now, what about um, analysts as well? I mean, you have to kind of cozy up to them and give them selected information and I mean, that's another sales pitch of a sort. This is interesting. Within the literature on, on, on earnings management, there are three views about what companies can do with, to deal with this uh, uh, kind of analyst expectations. One is to completely disengage. So, and, uh, for example, uh, when, when, when companies have faced accounting problems because they were trying to optimize their short-term earnings and they were found, their natural response is that, okay, from now on, we are not going to talk to analysts, we are not going to provide guidance. Now, another approach for some companies, and in the U.S. recently Dell decided to go private, is to completely withdraw from the, from the public markets and to basically find private investors that you can engage and you can discuss issues. And you, you sometimes you see that companies that have to do drastic um, strategic changes, they sometimes prefer to do that in a private context yeah, where they don't have to be exposed in quarterly everything that is happening. My sense is that the most enlightened way to, to manage these uh, investors is to understand what are your key success factors, which would be not just earnings, but the dimensions that are predictors of your future strategic performance. If you engage with the, with the uh, in, uh, analysts to understand those dimensions, then you are using the power of the analyst to force you to pursue those long-term objectives. Now, the problem with that is that 
as the analysts understand your long-term key performance indicators, so do your competitors. So, so there, there is a trade-off. I mean, if you reveal too much about your business model, potentially you are also educating your competitors. Now that's a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> um, wh wh whom did you study in this research? Give me a little bit of uh, like who it was, how long you studied. Okay. That kind of so so the, the, the paper specifically that, that we presented recently focused on the airline, in airline industry. So we looked at a, at a, a period of about eight years on the US airline industry, and we look at quarterly decisions uh, by the companies in terms of pricing and capacity decisions in many, many different markets, and looked at how those were influenced by the earnings pressure that they faced at the beginning of the quarter. Now, which period did you look so at? So that was from 1994 until uh, September 11th. So we basically ended the, the sample in September 11th because that was a, a big uh, yeah, shock the, to the, the industry. The game changer, yeah. yeah. But th that was a period where things looked good at some point, things didn't look so good. So it, it, was, a, it was a good representation of the business cycle. Uh, however, this is just one paper of a stream of research. I mean, we have also done research on the electricity industry. We have also done research kind of look comparing across different sectors. So we, we, we have found that this phenomenon of uh, adapting competitive behavior to earnings pressure is kind, kind of resilient across different contexts. What did you find out or what's your view based on your research of, of some of the issues that are facing companies like, I mean, shareholders are getting much more vocal and, and active. Um, they're almost attacking in, in, in some cases. Sony and Apple are good examples of this. I mean, what's your take on all of this? The situation of Apple is, is particularly interesting given, uh, given our study because Steve Jobs' philosophy was of the first category that I described. He did not engage with Wall Street. So he said, okay, well, if you want to invest in me, or my company, go ahead, but I'm not going to be guiding you and announcing and providing these benchmarks about how well or bad I'm going to be doing. And the fact is that as long as he produced the results, the investors love the company. My sense is that now uh, the company is facing more and more pressures for investors in terms of returning cars, dividend policies, increasingly evaluating the innovation strategy and releases of the company. And I think that is very dangerous. So if Tim Cook starts to decide whether to launch a product or not based on the opinion of Wall Street and the stock price rather than the long-term uh, future of the company, I think that would be really wrong and really bad for Apple. So, yeah. so he said they certainly need to watch out. It seems as though they are. I mean, they're, they, they all look a little nervous every time you see them. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's just anecdotal. Um, wh what's a good example of a, of a company that kind of goes against this short-term pressure uh, and then successfully manages some long-term strategy? Probably the most famous on doing this would be Amazon. So now you could criticize Amazon because for many years, I mean, despite sitting in a fantastic market share, they were not really producing large earnings. They were reinvesting in additional gains of market share. But clearly you see there a situation where an entrepreneur that owns a substantial share of the company, in addition to long-term investors, really investing in competitive position and a very, very strong competitive position that is going to have great value in the future. So I, th I think that that's a company to look at. I mean, Google in their prospectus, for example, when they went public, they also stated that they would be very careful to avoid this short-term pressure from, the, from the, financial, the financial sector. I'm not completely sure that they have done that so well. So I would say Amazon is number one in my view. How does it work vis-a-vis -vis separating the role of CEO and chairman? I mean, that's really more of a governance issue, mm -hmm. but in, to an extent it has to do with com competitiveness as well. Um, does, does corporate separation um, from executive pressures make a company's board better stewards, or how does that work? Well, I think in principle it would help because it would allow the, the, the chairman and the board to provide the proper buffer between the investment pressures and the operation and execution decisions from, from the CEO and the company. Now, but it, it really depends on what is the perspective of the chairman, right? So you need to have a chairman that understands that part of the role is to filter out some of the short-term pressures to provide some long-term alignment of objectives for, for the management. If the chairman just yes, 
sees the, 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 the analyst forecast and, the, and then just say, okay, you guys need to do this other way. Then in a way they are multiplying the effect because they are bringing that voice a lot more intensely inside the company. So they, they, they need to, to be selective on how they filter that outside information. Let me end by asking you some of the main takeaways of, of your research. And if you had to make three recommendations to companies today, what would that be? Well, I, I think the first one would be uh, if you are thinking of taking actions, I mean, whether it's accounting, but in, in many cases, I mean, they could be about the intensity of competition. Just to optimize long-term earnings, be careful, don't do it. This is not going to be good for you. I mean, it may, it may actually... It may actually be good for your job or for your income in the short term, but this is going to damage the, the, the company. Uh, the second is what we discussed about the engagement with, uh, with uh, investors. So although you cannot pick your investors, you can do things that would attract particular type of investors and others. And particularly the, the deep engagement that you will have with long-term investors would provide a shield or a protection against overreacting to those short-term uh, performance uh, evaluations. Uh, and, and the third point is with respect to incentives. I mean, within the financial world, stock-based incentives have been traditionally considered as the long-term objectives, long-term incentives for management. What we find is that that is not necessarily the case. So imagine that you have a large part of your wealth invested in stocks and options of your companies, but this is, these are stocks and options that you could exercise. If you do something that brings the stock price down tomorrow, this is going to hurt. This is going to hurt your wealth. And what we found is that managers that had a lot of vested stock-based incentives were not taking the right decisions. On the other hand, if the CEOs have unvested incentives, i.e stocks, restricted stocks, or unvested options that they cannot immediately exercise, then the structure of the incentive already forced them to look in the future rather than on the stock-based response today. So aligning the, the, the stock-based incentives to the time horizon of the strategy is very important. You kind of change the carrot, as it were. That's right, move the carrot <laughs> along, that's right. Javier Jimeno, thank you very much for being with us on NCED Knowledge. It's been a pleasure, thank you.